Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to uh, Gunst Dental Lunch and Learns uh, with our Proper Practice Partners. We've got an exciting three weeks um, coming up. My name's Sam Martin. I'm the brand manager at Gunst Dental um, and also uh, part of the family business as we're independently owned, Australian owned, and we're really proud of that um, as Gunst Dental to provide a family business that uh, helps grow your businesses uh, to move forward. Um, we've got a really exciting presentation today, the first one uh, that we've got of our three-week seminars, followed by two weeks with Angus Pryor. And today we've got Manu um, presenting on how to, uh, how to get case conversion using sedation. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Manu um, and get him to introduce himself a little bit more. And I'm really excited about how what Manu does, um, I think has a large impact of getting overcoming those fears, um, for getting people in the chair and also increases your opportunity to um, do better dental work um, on your patients. So Manu, um, over to you. Thank you very much for that, Trevor. Um, and of course, thank you, thank you uh, uh, to Guns for organising this. Um, Look, I, I think the advertising for this um, suggested that the topic would be how to increase case conversion using IV sedation. But with your permission, I'd actually like to do more than that and talk about um, how to offer more services, how to increase your production, and most importantly, how to differentiate your practice, all of that using dental sedation. So we're going to talk about five things today. Uh, and hopefully there'll be time for questions at the end. So I want to focus on firstly, what's in it for the patient? Now I'm assuming we're all in business for the patient. Um, also, what's in it for you in terms of production? M most importantly, what's in it for your whole practice? And my favorite section is, I'd like to touch on some of the fallacies that I hear. Uh, every single day, and I'd like to sort of dispel them once and for all. And then we'll just do a, a quick summary of what I'd like you to take away from, from this presentation. So, a little bit about me. Um, for those that don't know me, my name is Manu Vellani, and I um, head bespoke dental sedation. So, we are a mobile uh, sedation service exclusively for dentists. Um, we're not afraid of traveling. Uh, uh, you know, pre-COVID, I had a practice that extended the whole eastern seaboard of Australia. Uh, so I am a dentist, um, and I did my further training in sedation about 14 years ago. But for the last three years, I have uh, devoted all my time exclusively to IV sedation. So I've given up clinical dentistry, and all I do is sedation for our dentists. In those 14 years, I've done, and this is a conservative figure, I've done well over 3,000 cases. Look, there's two things I want to say about the slide, and they're both going to be, there's, there's, but there's quite a lot in both these statements, and hopefully we can discuss this in detail at the end. But firstly, in my opinion, there is no one, no one better giving sedation for dentistry than another dentist. No one. Secondly, in the 3,000 odd cases that I have done, I have never, touch wood, had to use a reversal drug, let alone an emergency drug. So there's a lot behind that. And as I said, if we've got time, um, I'd like to explore that more at the end. Okay, so let's talk about um, the first thing, which is what's in it for the patient. I'd like to start off here. Now, I don't know how many people know, uh, how, many people, how many of you know about this program. It's on SBS. It's a weekly current affairs program where they go into a topic uh, in, in some detail. They usually have uh, um, industry, topic, industry leaders and experts as a panel and, or, and a live audience. Look, they did one on dentistry a few months ago and the bottom line, is that it was a huge reality check for the profession. There were three recurring themes, okay? The first was accessibility, the second was cost, and the third was fear. Now, interestingly enough, 
fear occupied more than half the show. And that's what I'd obviously like to focus on today. So let's explore that a bit more. During the show, there were stories of patients, numerous stories of patients with severe phobias and the effects those phobias had on their lives, not just their mouths, on their lives. Almost everyone mentioned how scared they were. And interestingly, the consensus was not enough dentists out there are catering for people with fear and anxiety. Now I've put the Facebook logo up there uh, and I've done that for a reason. So that hopefully um, it's still here and I can, I'd like to read um, a quote from one of the uh, practitioners who was there on that night. Now remember, this is, this is not me. Uh, in fact, this is from Matthew Hopcraft, who is the CEO of the Victorian branch of the ADA. And I'll just quote this one paragraph. Uh, this is Matthew again speaking, quote, fear stroke anxiety was highlighted on the show last night with a number of the patients talking about paralyzing fear that prevented them from visiting the dentist. Dental fear affects up to two in four people, just remember that, two in four people, but, um, and stories told suggested that this was sometimes handled well and sometimes poorly by dentists, perhaps pointing to a need for greater training in managing fearful patients. It's important that we don't underestimate the importance of fear as a factor in poor oral health. Okay, let's move on. This was a study back, done back in 2010, and it, was, it appeared in the Australian Dental Journal, okay, where it showed that 49% of Australians suffer from some level of dental anxiety. Now, that's, that's incredible, nearly one in two. And if we, just, if we take a more conservative approach, and let's call that one in three, okay, that's one in three of your patients that you, you, know, you may or may not know about are suffering from dental anxiety. So just keep that in mind. So I'd like some uh, audience interaction at this stage. And I just wanna, uh, just in the chat, in the chat box, please, if, if people could just type, who are your typical fearful patients that you come across? So just think about the one or two or so that you know are tremendously fearful. And I just want uh, three things from you. Just number one, uh, male or female. Number two, the age or the age group that that patient belongs to. And number three, what sort of services do they require? If, um, if you wouldn't mind just putting that in the chat. Okay, so I'm not seeming to get anything through here. So maybe, look, um, uh, if we can just start off with, um, are they typically male or female? They're anxious. And the next question then is, uh, what sort of age are they or what sort of age group? Okay, and the third, the third point is, what's the typical sort of treatment are they after or do they require? Thank you, Archana, for your responses. Um, okay, so. I went through my 3,000 cases and, um, you know, I, I, I tried to find groups of patients uh, that we treated. And I, we came across two very obvious groups, okay? The first is um, this sort of a patient. Now, we've typified this as a female, but could equally be a male, all right? And here are the characteristics. They're typically 20 to 35 years of age. Um, they suffer from apprehension, often very severe. They are time poor. They're balancing lots of things. And this, by the way, is a huge market. Okay, and we'll come back to that. And these, this is the sort of work that they need. And what I'd like you to pick up is it's not just surgical. Okay, there's a lot of IV done for restorative, for endo and for hygiene. And you'll see all this. The other big group is um, uh, a gentleman like Brian. Now, uh, again, equally, you know, it could be female, but certain characteristics. They're typically older, 40 to 60 years of age. All right. They have 
had previous bad experiences. There is long-term dental neglect. They're either successful and or retired. They have both the time and the money. They need a major rehabilitation. They often need multiple phases of treatment. And for the first time in their life, they're in a position where they can value definitive long-term care. So what I'd like you to do is just go back and just think about the patients, which I'm sure you all have in your own practices that fit these two groups. Okay, so again, um, I just would like to give you some examples of the feedback that we have received um, from patients. Here's one, I would definitely recommend this service to anyone who has dental anxiety. Another one, my nerves were at ease and I was unable to feel anything at all. And a third one, I could not have asked for a better process. These are just, I have not cherry picked these. I wanna make it very clear. These are just three of the many Google reviews you can check out for yourselves that we've received. And in fact, um, you know, we've got far better ones than these, but you get, you get the point. Patients love it. All right, now let's talk about production. So I need us all now to just drop down a level and we're just gonna talk about money just for a few minutes, please. All right, so I'm going to, I would, I'd like to compare four days, a typical day in dentistry, okay, without sedation, versus a typical morning with sedation. Compare that to an average day with sedation. And then finally, I just want to show you what an amazing day, which frankly is almost impossible without sedation. All right, so again, please, um, some audience input. What's a typical day in terms of production in your practice? Now, this is not for the whole practice, it's per per practitioner, per producer. So whether it's an associate or a principal, but what's, a, what's an average and, or what's a range, please? I'd like, I'd like it to come from the audience so that um, it makes it more realistic. Okay. So look, if I could just um, take sort of an average of, of what I'm seeing and let's call it, you know, and it doesn't have to be specific. It's it's just it's just a point. Okay, let's call it three to four thousand. Okay, per producer per day on a on a typical day. All right. So now let's look at a typical morning with sedation. All right. We're going to do two scenarios. Here's the first. Two patients, and this is very typical. Okay, and there'll be two cases of wisdom tooth removal. Usually four teeth per case. So again, I'm going to need some input. What's, 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 a, what's a sort of a typical fee for two cases of wisdom teeth removal? If you could just ch um, type it into the chat box rather than Q&A, it'd be, be um, a little bit more helpful for me. Okay, here we go. Let's call it 4,000, okay? Just as, a, just as a rough. Some people are going to be more, some people are going to be less. Okay, let's take another scenario. Now this time, we're only gonna see one patient. And yes, it's a long case and there's a lot of work. So this is typical. They'll do two surgical extractions. They may or may not do grafting. They'll do some fillings. They'll do a root therapy. Usually it's a molar or something and they'll do a clean. So yes, it's a lot of work and it's on that typical patient that's left it for a long time and wants it all done in one hit. Okay, okay. again, can you give me a fee? Just a fee for this sort of work. Let's not even include the grafting, all right? Let's be really conservative. Two surgical extractions, three fillings, complex root therapy, and a clean. So here's sort of an average that I'm seeing. Okay, now there's a couple of things here I'd like you to uh, focus on. Firstly, have a look at the number of patients required. Very, very few. Very few, and you'll see this theme everywhere. Okay, and the other thing is just compare the numbers. Remember, this is a whole day, this is just a morning, and it's a very typical morning. Okay, let's move on. Let's now have a look at an average day with sedation. Okay, now, first of all, 
it's five patients for the whole day. Now you're going to probably, you should be asking me, how come when we can see two patients in the morning only, we can do five in the whole day? Well, basically because um, there is no lunch. We effectively work right the way through. Now, this list I'm about to share with you, interestingly, is from a practice in regional New South Wales, and it is only the second time they have done sedation. Only the second time. And this was just a week or so ago. So it's very real, very recent. I've taken it straight directly off the list. Okay, five patients. First patient, two simple extractions for a child. Again, if you could please just type, as I, as I go through these cases, just type into the chat room um, um, what sort of fees you'd be charging for, these, for this treatment. Okay. The second case, three root therapies, simple ones. Third case, 26 extractions and a full on full issue. Now, again, we're talking about regional New South Wales here. The fourth case, 11 extractions and a lower full issue. And the final case was surgical removal of wisdom teeth. So again, I might not wait for all the responses because it, it is taking a bit of time, but can I suggest that typically when I show this presentation to people, typically the figure that we get is around about the $15,000 mark. Okay. All right. And then finally, I just want to touch on what is possible and what some of my practices are actually doing. Again, this is very recent and very real. I have not made any of this up. So two scenarios, two, two practices. The first practice, four patients. All right. Now, we're talking about long days here, by the way. Okay. First case, all on four, single arch. Second case, two extractions, two inlays, one onlay, and some peria. Third case, three surgical extractions, two crowns. Can you see there's a mix, by the way? It's not just surgery. It's restorative. It's endo. It's hygiene. And the fourth case is um, wisdom teeth. So again, very small numbers of patients required. And the figure that I usually get here is around the twenty dollars to $25,000 month. Let's call it twenty dollars to be conservative. All right. And then finally, here's a practice that we typically just see two patients for the whole day. One in the morning, have lunch, one in the afternoon. And what are the cases? Well, they're both all on four single large cases. And again, a conservative figure here would be 35,000. So just to bring it home in graphical form, okay? Because this is very important. If that represents a typical day in production in dentistry, you should find that if you do it properly, a morning in sedation dentistry should either equal or slightly better than the whole day. A whole day, an average day in sedation dentistry should double or triple what a typical day is. And of course, an exceptional day is just that. Absolutely exceptional. All right, let's move on. What's in it for the practice? Well, again, I'd like to just start with the feedback that I get. And again, this, this is all available on my website. Um, so what I typically get, and this, you know, I would get one of these four comments or, you know, something similar every week. So I can't believe how easy that was. Or if I could, I'd do all my work under IV. Now, this particular, uh, this particular comment was from a practice principal. This was from an associate. These next two are from practice managers. It's great for patients because they don't remember a thing. Remember, they're at the coalface. The team really likes sedation days because they find it relaxing. Again, some feedback from practitioners, all available on my website. Nothing has had a greater impact on my practice than sleep dentistry. I, I'm going to show you three here, three quotes. All these three practitioners are very are at the top of their field. They offer everything in dentistry. And for them to say something like, you know, IV sedation has had the greatest impact, that says a lot. 
Okay, I would highly recommend the use of IV sedation. I won't, I won't read it all, it's all available on the website. And Dr. Willie, categorically changed my approach to complex dental treatment. All right, so in terms of the practice, there's a couple of things. You've got to get the practice ready. And it's not much, but there's a few little things. First of all, space. Now, you know, there's, there's going to be an additional person in the room, the sedationist, and additional equipment. So there is some requirement for space. Not much more, but a little bit more. The point I'm trying to make here, though, is that if you have two surgeries, one's larger than the other, I'd be doing sedation in the larger one. Okay? And then the rest is simple. We, we do need good lighting. You do need good suction. Okay, but you should be having that anyway. Blankets are a really good idea because patients under sedation tend to get cold. And a wheelchair. Now, a wheelchair is totally option, optional. It's not mandatory, but it's a very nice touch and it's a very nice way for patients to be escorted out of the practice. I've highlighted these two points because they are probably the, the most significant from your perspective. So let's just go into those two a little bit more. Oxygen is mandatory for IV sedation. No ifs or buts. It's the only thing a practice has to provide. Everything else a sedationist usually brings with them. There needs to be enough, okay? And that's important. It's not just for the procedure, but it has to include the recovery time for each procedure. And just as a side note, if you are offering nitrous oxide sedation, well, you've already got oxygen, and it becomes a zero cost exercise now to introduce sedation into your practice. And we'll talk about scheduling. The general rule is whatever time you require for the dental treatment, you add one more hour for the sedation. And you split that extra hour up into two bits. 20 minutes at the front end for induction and 40 minutes at the back end for recovery. It usually doesn't take this long but they're just buffers in place. And the bottom line is over 14 years, I can tell you that if you do this, you are gonna basically run on time all day long. All right, I'm often asked what sort of special equipment's required. Again, not much. You are gonna need a mouth prop because patients you know, find it very difficult to keep their mouths open. So there's some examples. You're gonna need a sponge or a retractor, okay? for airway protection. Now you can use gauze, you can even use a kitchen sponge that's shaped up, okay? But you need something. And I just wanna to touch on this, uh, the Isolite. I don't know how many people have used this or heard of it, but it's worth noting that all my top practices, all of them, bar none, have, have, um, have these on hand for, for their sedation cases. And it's, it's, this is not cheap, but, if you're going to do a lot of sedation, it's well worth it because it's four or five things in one. So it's a mouth prop, it's suction, it's retraction, um, and it's airway protection. Okay, all at once. Oh, and it's lighting as well. All right, so they're the five things. Really worth considering. All right, I'm often asked, you know. What sort of patients are suitable for this? Look, we're trained by anaesthetists and anaesthetists look at patients and classify them according to this system, which is called the ASA system of classification. And it's a physical status system. So we basically assess the patient's reserves for stress. And it, I'm not gonna go into it in detail, but basically it goes from class one to class six, from normal healthy to basically dead, okay? We can treat one and two easily, and many in three if they're controlled. And I just want to highlight this, class two, look at this, hypertension, diabetes, asthma, obesity, smoking, can all be treated under sedation. So, you know, the market is huge. Um, so these are the suitable patients. Again, ASA class one or two, no problems. ASA class three, if they are controlled. No problems. So a controlled diabetic, a controlled hypertensive patient, not an issue. Everyone else is best referred. Um, 
probably it's probably more apt to talk about who is not CERB. So again, if they're ASA three or more and not controlled, just forget about them. Anyone in danger of an airway compromise. So if they're obese or if they have really bad obstructive sleep apnea, probably not a good idea. These are both relative, by the way. Okay, so it's case by case basis. Age is an important parameter as well. Okay, I've put down there eight to 70. The eight is the bottom end and that is um, absolute. Okay, strict medical legal requirements on that. The 70 is relative and it's on a case by case basis. I've treated 70 year olds who physically are like 50 year olds and I've treated 40 year olds who are like 80 year olds. So the age on the top end is very much relative. Um, and of course, you know, pregnant patients shouldn't be treated under sedation. All right. Obviously, anxious or phobic patients are a slam dunk for sedation, but I just want to try and stretch your minds now and just think of some of the other categories which are very suitable. And all of my top practices, truth be told, um, maybe 50% of the cases are for anxious, phobic patients, and the other 50% are all these other types. So what are they? They're just doing an unpleasant or long procedure and they want the patient comfortable. They're doing treatment that would normally take multiple visits, but they want to do it at once, or the patient wants it done at once. Time poor. Or increasingly, I'm finding the access to general anesthesia for dental lists is getting harder and harder. So it just avoids that inconvenience. The other thing too is, the risks of general anesthesia are far greater than sedation, and the recovery from general anesthesia tends to be uh, more complex than sedation. But there are lots of other indications. Gagging. Uh, sedation will almost eliminate gagging totally. So that you know, makes it a lot easier to treat a patient. We've all been there. Um, patients with hypertension. A lot of dentists will just treat patients with hypertension under sedation simply because they know that under sedation, their blood pressure and heart rate comes down. So it becomes a much safer procedure. And then of course, special care, special care patients is another very big segment. I personally have treated patients that fall under all these um, categories. Okay. Now we'll come on to fallacies, which is my favorite part of this presentation. This is stuff I hear every single day and I really would like to dispel them. We're just gonna talk about three, the three big ones. So the first one I get is, you know, I mean, I'd really like to do this, but you know, we're only small practice and we don't have a special recovery room. Okay, you don't need one. You don't need one clinically, you don't need one legally. In my opinion, they're best, it's best if patients are left in the recovery room, uh, sorry, in the procedure room itself. And we as a team move to another surgery if we have to, and that patient is cared for by another staff member. All right, fallacy number two. We need extra staff, don't we, for sedation? Absolutely not, okay? You do your dentistry normally. So if you work with one assistant, you work with one. If you work with two, you work with two. If you work with three, you work with three. Everything is normal. The chair position is normal. The LA is normal. Everything is normal. The sedationist, remember, is in the room at all times, and they can be used for staff, extra staffing. For example, the opening of sterile bags or you know, things of that nature. And the third fallacy, sedation is prone to emergencies. This is absolutely untrue, okay? There's two points I wanna make here. If you look at um, an emergency in a dental setting and you trace the pathway back, it inevitably stems initially from anxiety, stress, phobia, okay? So if you eliminate that right from the outset, the chance of an adverse event drops dramatically. That's point number one. Point number two, um, God forbid you do have a medical emergency. Well, isn't it handy to have intravenous access already present? It certainly makes the management of that emergency much better. All right. So let's just summarize. 
what I'd like you to just get out of this pr uh, presentation, very simply, okay? Controlling anxiety and pain is now a fundamental expectation of your patients. The media have picked up on this, research has picked up on this, okay? Patients love it. Okay? If you're not looking after them from a pain and anxiety point of view, they will find somebody who does. We have shown, I hope, very clearly that it dramatically, dramatically boosts production in your practice. And finally, it's a win, win, win scenario for your practice. It's a win for the, for the operators. It's a win for staff, clinical and non-clinical. And it is a win for your practice in terms of its um, uh, market share, of its um, uh, ability to do more procedures and more diverse procedures, and uh, its reputation, frankly. So I'm just going to end with one more slide. And I was just thinking, what, what differentiates the practices that have taken this on wholeheartedly from the ones that haven't? You know, is it because they're better dentists? No. Is it because they have flashy practices? No. Um, basically, I, I, you know, I really gave it some thought and I came up with this. And basically, it's just three steps and it's so simple. And this is what they've all done. It's absolutely universal. The first step is they've learned more. So whether they've contacted me or they've read or talked to other people, whatever. Okay. So they've learned more about what's involved. What are the pros? What are the cons? They have prepared their practice, okay? So simply, they've got the mouth props. They've checked the suction. They've made sure there's oxygen. They've realized that it's a different day that requires a different schedule. Simple stuff. And then you know what? They've just done their first case. Because okay? at the end of the day, this is the only way you are going to find out whether this is for you and for your practice. And you know what? It's not for everyone at all, but I can assure you in my experience that that would be the exception rather than the rule. So it's as simple as that. Learn more, prepare your practice and just try it, see if it works for you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I hope you got something out of it. They're all my details. Okay? I'm, very, I'm very approachable, happy to talk sedation any, any day. Um, so mobile, email or website. Um, and I hope I have been true to the topic and you can see, I, you know, the business case that is IV sedation and that you can offer more services. You can dramatically boost your production and you can certainly differentiate your practice in what is becoming an increasingly competitive environment. So look, I, time permitting, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much and thank you again to Guns for the opportunity. Well, thank you, Manu. And if you've got any questions, um, we'll get Manu to answer them. We'll just continue for another couple of minutes. Um, so just put them up in the Q&A uh, section for us and um, we can okay. uh, answer your questions through there. Sam, I've got one here, okay. Um, uh, hi, Manu. What about difficult local patients? So, in other words, not going numb to do regulation, you know, regular procedures. Great question. And um, look, the beauty of it is by the time local anaesthetic is um, um, administered to an IV patient, that patient is starting to drop off to sleep. Okay. You are still going to need local. There's no ifs or buts and no way around that. And the reason for that, by the way, is the patients are conscious. So the one thing they will, that will wake them up, if you like, is pain. So what we found is, hey, you can actually give more local, a little bit more local, as long as it's safe, of course. And um, we found that patients who, have, who are difficult to anaesthetize normally are easily treated with the benefit of sedation. So I hope I've answered that question. Um, someone's asked to repeat the first fallacy. Okay. Well, the first fallacy, um, going back now, was uh, you, we need a special dedicated recovery room. Okay. Um, absolutely not. You do not need 
a special recovery room. Look, if it, some practices have them and they're great. We obviously, we take advantage of that, but it's not an absolute requirement. It's certainly not legally required nor clinically required. Are there any other questions? Anyone else have any more questions? Put them up in the Q&A. Um, while we're just waiting for that, I think this raises a lot of um, a lot of questions internally too. I think there's a lot of merit uh, to using sedation and uh, increasing your earning potential is uh, something we're all looking at at the moment. Uh, Sam, it's not just, to... Sam, if, sorry, if I can just interrupt. It's not just the increase in the earning potential. It is the sheer ease in which they increase the earning potential, right? And the pleasure, <laughs> because at the end of the day, all right, the patient is just relaxed and frankly, couldn't care less about what's happening around them, okay? So the dentist is not involved in any conversations. They come in, they do their work, they leave. Simple as that. And I think we've just got another question pop up with that. And no. Um, what, uh, what do we have to do to set up our first case? Very simple. Great question. Um, whoever asked that. <laughs> Best question. Um, now, look. Um, contact me. All right. Um, I'll discuss the case with you just to make sure there's, there's not going to be any issues. And I'll just email you a template get your staff or whatever to fill out the template. It's just basic stuff about the patient because what happens is you email me back the template, I contact the patient, I do a full uh, sort of pre-sedation consultation, if you like, over the phone. The patients are emailed a lot of information, so they're fully informed. That's what I'm getting at. And all of this is done behind the scenes. And then, you know, the hardest thing is scheduling a convenient time that suits the practice, <laughs> the patient and me. Once we get over that, everything else just flows. Um, which drug do you use for, <laughs> for isolation? Okay. Um, there's a number. The main drug is midazolam, which is a benzodiazepine. So it provides sedation uh, primarily, and it provides amnesia. So patients essentially don't remember anything the next day some of them don't even remember how they got home and can i just say that is your biggest biggest marketing tool right there because despite the length of the procedure despite how traumatic the procedure has been and you know some are um, the patient's reality is such that they didn't feel anything they don't remember anything, and it was totally bliss for them. Anything else? Excellent. Well, Dr. Villani, thank you so much for your time today. Um, I found it very, very informative, and um, it ties into our Profitable Practice Partners program that we're really proud of at Gunns Dental is working with independent suppliers and as an independent supplier working with independent business um, to help grow the dental practice in Australia. And as a family owned business, we're really, really proud of um, helping the Australian and the New Zealand dental industry. Um, and that's our focus and that's where we live and uh, we want to see it grow. So we get better clinical outcomes for everyone in the country um, and in New Zealand. So, Thank you very much for your time. I'd also like to thank Angus Pryor for helping facilitate uh, today. Um, and Angus works closely with Dr. Villani too. And we also look forward to the next two weeks, um, same time, uh, different place. Uh, we've got two weeks of Angus Pryor coming up. Um, so there's no more questions or Angus, uh, you don't want to jump on, um, I think, we can close that and we thank everyone for their participation um, and one, look forward one, one to the question. Their... Sam, one further question has come through. I'll just put it in the chat for Manu. Okay, yes. Okay, so what training do you provide for the team? Another great question. Um, look, uh, I certainly go through some emergency management with every team. I, I you know, and again, the sedationist tends to bring 
all the emergency apparatus, medications, reversal drugs, the whole box and dice. Okay, so the secret of an emergency, of managing an emergency is team, is teamwork, all right? So we have to work as a team. So yes, practice is critical. The other thing that I would strongly recommend is, if you, you know, if you're gonna do this seriously, and my top level practices do this annually, they get somebody in, and I can organize this, they get somebody in who um, trains your team in your practice with your surroundings, um, for emergency management under sedation conditions, all right? And I mean, it doesn't get any better than that because at the end of the day, you wanna be able to manage that emergency in your practice, okay? You're not worried about any, anywhere else. So, um, and every practice is slightly different and there are nuances. So look, emergency management is an important, um, is an important thing and the, whoever has asked that, I love the way you're thinking because that, that's the name of the game. It's all about risk management. And if you do that, if you take that approach, you'll, you really shouldn't have a problem. How do you manage the nervousness of the dentist performing the treatment, having their skills of so Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Trevor. Um, look, I usually don't find this a problem, to be honest, because I'm usually tucked towards the foot of, you know, towards the foot of the patient. Um, and or further away, so I'm nowhere near the the operating um, field. But look, I'm I'm not one to uh, I'm not one to interfere with, with with dental treatment at all. You know, they're doing their thing. I've got to do my thing. We just work together for the safety and comfort of the patient. That's it. I think that's it. Excellent. Well, with that, I hope everyone has enjoyed their lunch and enjoyed <laughs> their conversation, and uh, we look forward to seeing you all next week. Thank you and uh, have a good afternoon. Thank you, everyone.